Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives this afternoon. Whether you're here in the theater or watching us on YouTube, we're glad you could join us for today's discussion of David Grant's new book, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. Before we get started, I want to uh, alert you to two other programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow at 7 p.m., we continue the celebration of President John F. Kennedy's 100th birthday with a concert by the Air Force Strings. This acclaimed ensemble will pr uh, provide musical selections that were performed in the Kennedy White House. And on Tuesday, June 20th at noon, Douglas Edgerton will be here to talk about his newest book, Thunder at the Gates, the Black Civil War Regiments that Redeemed America, which chronicles the formation and battlefield triumphs of the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantry and the 5th Cavalry. To learn more about these and all of our programs and exhibitions, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And you'll also find brochures about no other National Archives activities. In Killers of the Flower Moon, David Gran has unearthed a story of murder corruption and injustice, it's probably safe to say that most of us had not heard of the mysterious deaths of Osage women and men in the 1920s, but stories once forgotten can gain new life when someone seeks out the historical record and puts the pieces together. In reviewing Killers of the Moon in the Washington Post, Scott Berg wrote, he's canny about the stories he chases, he's willing to go anywhere to chase them, and he's a maestro in his ability to parcel out information at just the right clip. Tom Drury, writing for Slate, remarked, Grant's singular style is to find a story that, while not unknown, is not known enough, and to dig so deeply and precisely into the historical record that what he finds not only amplifies and builds upon the record, but arrives with the force of revelation. What makes Killers of the Moon so compulsively readable is Grand's ability to draw characters from the page of history and give them the aura of living, breathing humans. Every day, people make discoveries in the National Archives and in archives and collections around the globe. And we who work with those records encourage the curious to seek out the stories behind the stories. And I'm so proud that this story was made possible by access to records here at the National Archives. David Grant is a New York Times best-selling author and an award-winning staff writer at the New Yorker magazine. His first book, The Lost City of Z, a tale of deadly obsession in the Amazon, became a number one New York Times bestseller, was chosen as one of the best books of 2009 by multiple news outlets, and has also been adapted into a major motion picture. The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, Grant's collection of stories, was named by Man's, Men's Journal, one of the best true crime books ever written. His stories have also appeared in the best American crime writing, the best American sports writing, and the best American non-required reading. <laughs> <laughs> He's previously written for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, The Wall Street Journal, and The New Republic. Introducing David is a special pleasure. David was the 2013-2014 David Ferriero Fellow at the Cullman Center for Writers and Scholars at the New York Public Library. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Grant. David, thank you uh, for that lovely introduction. Thank you all uh, for coming today. Uh, I really would not be here without David. Um, uh, and without the support of the National Archives. This book is um, really based on uh, archives both um, here and in, in Maryland uh, that are part of the National Archives and out in Fort Worth, Texas. I spent many, many weeks um, and much of the book uh, is rooted in the materials I found here. And so uh, this place really is a national treasure and uh, this book would not exist without it. Um, so, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the new book, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. And the book um, 
began or the project began uh, several years ago uh, when I made a visit uh, out to um, Osage Territory, the Osage Nation in Northeast Oklahoma. And when I was there, um, I visited uh, the Osage Nation Museum. And on the wall, they had this enormous panoramic photograph, which if you uh, later see the book, uh, is across the full pictures, across the title page. It's quite enormous. Um, and it looks very innocent. Um, it was taken in 1924. Uh, it shows members of the tribe uh, along with uh, white settlers. But I noticed um, at the museum that a portion of the photograph was missing, that somebody had cut it out. It looked like someone had taken a scissors to it. And I asked the then museum director, who I was meeting for the first time, she would later become a friend of mine over the years. Um, I said, what happened to that missing panel? Uh, and she said it had contained a figure so frightening that she decided to remove it. And she then pointed to the missing panel, and she said the devil was standing right there. And the book grew out of trying to understand who that figure was uh, and the anguishing history he embodied. And it led me uh, to what I would come to realize was one of the most sinister crimes in American history, one that I believe tells a much larger story about this country. Now, to understand the crimes, uh, you need to understand that uh, when they took place, which was in the early 20th century, um, the Osage Indians of Oklahoma at that time were millionaires. Um, oil had been discovered under their land, um, and prospectors uh, had to pay the Osage for leases and royalties. Um, and so early on, uh, the Osage, when the oil was discovered, began to receive you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, then the amounts grew into the thousand. There were only about 2,000 or so Osage on the tribal roll. Uh, and then it began to accumulate in the millions. In 1923, in that year alone, uh, those 2,000 or Osage on the tribal roll received what would be worth today more than $400 million. They have become the wealthiest people per capita in the world. Lo and behold, a New York newspaper exclaimed at the time, the Indian, instead of starving to death, enjoys a steady income that turns bankers green with envy. Now the public became transfixed with the Osage oil wealth, which belied long-standing stereotypes of Native Americans that traced all the way back to the first brutal contact with whites. Reporters would head out there and describe with an element of prejudice and envy and wonder uh, the quote-unquote red millionaires and the quote-unquote plutocratic Osage with their terracotta mansions and their servants, many of whom were white. It was said at the time, whereas one American might own a car, each Osage owned 11 of them. And this photograph is quite striking um, because here you could see a traditional Osage mother with her daughters in the 20s dressed as flappers. Now, the tangled history of how the Osage had gotten hold of this uh, oil-rich land goes all the way back to the 17th century when the Osage controlled much of uh, what was then the central part of the country, all the way from Missouri, Kansas, all the way out to the edge of the Rockies. Um, in 1803, uh, Thomas, uh, President Thomas Jefferson referred to the Osage as the great nation. And he actually met with a delegation of Osage chiefs at the White House. And uh, he assured them that um, the US government would treat them only as friends and benefactors. But of course, within a few years, he began to drive them off their land. And over the next few decades, the Osage were forced to cede more than 100 million acres of their ancestral territory. In the 1860s, they were bunched up uh, in a reservation in Kansas. Once more, they were under siege by settlers and squatters. Among them was none other than the family of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And a scene in the novel, um, which was based, loosely based on our experience, Laura asked her mom, why don't you like Indians? I just don't like them. And don't lick your fingers, Laura. This is Indian country, isn't it, Laura said? What do we come to this country for if you don't like them? One evening, Laura's father explains to her that the government will soon make the Osages move away. That's why we are here, Laura. White people are going to settle all this country, and we get the best land because we get here first and take our pick. In fact, uh, many of the squatters uh, began to seize the land by force. Um, there were massacres. The Osage were being driven off their land again. And the Osage uh, finally agreed once more 
to sell their territory, or they agreed to sell their territory, and search again for new homeland. A U.S. government official had said at the time uh, during these massacres and um, uh, when their land was being taken to Kansas, the question will suggest itself, which of these people are the savages? So once the Osage uh, sold their land, they needed to find a new homeland. And it was then that this Osage chief um, stood up at an Osage meeting, uh, tribal meeting, and he said, um, we should move to what was then Indian Territory, uh, would later become Oklahoma. He said, we should move there uh, because the land is rocky, it's infertile, and the white man considers it basically worthless and will finally leave us alone. He said, and there's a transcript uh, from his statement. He said, my people will finally be happy here. And so the Osage sold their territory and bought uh, this territory. Um, it's about the size of Delaware, but whites did consider it worthless because it wasn't good for farming. They bought it for 70 cents per acre, and they resettled there. And by then, uh, the migrations, the forced migrations, had taken a tremendous toll on the tribe. Uh, their numbers had dwindled to just a few thousand, a third of what they had been just 70 years earlier from disease uh, and massacres. Here you can see an early settlement on their new reservation with their lodges, which are like wigwams. Now, in 1906, um, the Osage, uh, the U.S. government um, decided uh, it wanted to um, make Indian Territory part of the state of Oklahoma, and it tried to force upon the Osage the final stage of its very brutal assimilation campaign, and that was called allotment. Um, for those of you not familiar, allotment was essentially a policy that uh, the U.S. government imposed on many American Indian nations, which was to break up the reservations, divvying up the land into private parcels. Each member of the tribe would receive an allotment, and the rest of the territory would be opened up to settlers. Um, the Osage had seen what had happened when territory near them, uh, this was some Cherokee territory, was opened up to settlers. It led to these Oklahoma land runs that are very famous. This is an actual photograph from the land run. Um, white uh, settlers would race down by foot or on horse, a bicycle, any which way they could. Um, and if they could get to the land first and put a stake into it, uh, they would claim it. Um, now, when the Osage uh, were, were negotiating the terms of their allotment treaty with the US government, they had more leverage than other American Indian nations because one, they owned a deed to their land. Two, um, there was a kind of a race to make Oklahoma state and they were the last tribe to be allotted. And three, they were led by one of their greatest chiefs at the time, a man who spoke seven languages, including French, Sui, and Latin. And they managed to insert into their treaty provision a term and a statement that at the time seemed rather curious. It said that we shall maintain all the subsurface mineral rights to our territory. Now, um, the Osage had a hint at that time that there was some oil under their land but nobody thought they were sitting upon a fortune. And they managed to hold on very shrewdly to this last bit of territory, the last realm, a realm that they could not even see. And um, each Osage was granted a head right, which was essentially a share in this mineral trust. Now, a head right could not be bought or sold. It could only be inherited. And after allotment, much of the surface territory disappeared into the hands of whites. But that subsurface territory could not be bought or sold. And so the Osage tribe collectively maintained control of what had become the world's first underground reservation. And before long, the oil boom had begun. Uh, there was such demand to drill in Osage territory that prospectors, including a lot of the most famous oil barons that names you would be familiar with, J.P. Getty uh, and his family, first struck oil in Osage territory. Uh, E.W. Marlin, uh, the Phillips brother, Frank Phillips and his brothers, um, uh, Harry Sinclair. Um, they would travel to Osage territory and there would be these auctions uh, where they would gather under this uh, very stately, uh, here you can see a picture of Frank Phillips and some of his executives arriving for an auction for leases on a private railroad car known as the Millionaire Special. And they would gather under this tree, the stately elm tree, where the auctioneer you can see in the center there, bidding on leases for uh, parcels of land to drill on. 
a single lease could sell for as much as two thousand dollars, and um, this tree became known as the millionaire uh, as the million dollar elm. Now, as the Osage prosperity increased, many Americans began to express alarm because of prejudice. Um, you have to understand that this was the 1920s, the period of the Great Gatsby, uh, a great prolificacy. But for some reason, the Osage and their money were scapegoated. And members of the US Congress would sit in uh, their committee hearing rooms and d debate and discuss, what are we going to do about these Osage and all their money? And they went so far as to pass legislation requiring that many Osage have white guardians to oversee their finances. Now, this system uh, was not abstractly racist. It was literally racist. It was, it, was, it, was, um, it was based on the quantum of Osage blood. So if you were a full-blooded Osage, you were deemed, quote, unquote, incompetent and given a white guardian. So here you could be a great Osage chief who led a nation, have millions in your trust, and yet you would have a white guardian telling you whether you could buy this car or that car or whether you get that toothpaste out at the corner store. And not only was the system racist, uh, it led to one of the largest state and federally sanctioned criminal enterprises as many of the guardians swindled, embezzled uh, millions and millions of dollars. At a congressional hearing, uh, this Osage chief um, testified, um, and he said that the whites had bunched us down here in the roughest part of the country, thinking we will drive these Indians down to where there's a big hill pile of rocks and put them there in that corner. Now that the pile of rocks had turned out to be worth millions of dollars, he said, everybody wants to get in here and get some of that money. Then the Osage began to die under mysterious circumstances. And one family uh, in particular was profoundly affected, the family of this woman, uh, Molly Burkhart. Now, Molly was really an extraordinary woman. She was born in 1886 in one of those lodges that you could see in the picture of one of the early settlements, uh, speaking Osage, uh, um, practicing Osage traditions. She was forced then at the age of just seven to be uprooted from her home by the US government to attend a uh, Catholic boarding school. Um, and then within a few decades, um, because of the oil money, she was speaking English. She was married to a white settler, a man named Ernest Burkhardt, who had come from Texas, who had been her chauffeur. And in many ways, she straddled not only uh, two centuries, but two civilizations. In 1921, she had an older sister named Anna. And um, Molly liked to entertain. She had people over that day. Uh, Molly came. Uh, she then left the house that evening and was not seen again. But Molly looked everywhere for her. She had her family look for her. Uh, and her sister, Anna, was found in a ravine a week later. She had been shot in the back of the head. And it was the first hint that Molly's family had become a prime target of this criminal conspiracy. Molly had a mother um, who lived in the house with her, uh, who within days grew mysteriously sick. And within two months of Anna's death, uh, she stopped breathing and died. And evidence would suggest uh, that she had been poisoned. And so within a span of two months, Molly, who you can see here uh, on the right, lost her sister, Anna, who was on the left, and lost her mother. Now, um, Molly had a younger sister who was so frightened. Her name was Rita. She was so frightened by these deaths. She'd been out in the countryside living with her husband and a maid. Uh, they decided to move closer to town to be near Molly, where they thought it would be safer. Uh, they moved into this house. Then one night at 3 in the morning, Molly woke up. She heard a loud explosion. Uh, she got up, and she went to the window, and she looked down in the direction of this house where her sister was. And all she could see was this large orange ball rising into the sky. Somebody had planted a bomb under her sister's house, killing Rita, killing Rita's husband, and a white maid who was 18 years old who left behind two young children. Now, it wasn't just Molly's family. Uh, that was being uh, targeted. Other Osage were being picked off one by one. There was a, a champion steer roper at the time, an Osage champion steer, ripe, steer roper. He received a call one night. He went outside. He came back. He dropped dead, frothing at the mouth. Evidence would later indicate that he had been given poison, most likely strychnine. For those of you who read Agatha Christie Mysteries, you know that it is an awful poison, one that causes the body to convulse as if with electricity while you suffocate, while you are still conscious until you mercifully die. 
Now, um, several of those who tried to catch the killers, they too were killed. Uh, there was an attorney who was thrown off a speeding train. He had been gathering evidence where he told his wife if anything should happen to him, go there. When his wife went to the hiding spot, um, somebody had already gotten there and cleaned out the evidence, as well as the money that he had left for her and their 10 children. Now, there was a uh, oil man who was friendly with the Osage, who came to Washington, D.C., to the nation's capital, to hopefully get federal authorities to take up the case. He checked into a boarding house. He received a telegram from an associate in Oklahoma that said, be careful. He carried with him a Bible and a pistol. He left the hotel, the, the boarding house, that evening. He was abducted. At some point, a burlap sack was wrapped around his head. His body was found the next day in a culvert. He had been beaten to death and stabbed more than 20 times. The Washington Post would later report what the Osage already knew. In a headline, it said, Conspiracy to Kill Rich Indians. Now, um, by 1923, more than two dozen people had been murdered and would have become known as the Osage Reign of Terror. One reporter wrote at the time that members of the tribe had been, quote, shot in lonely pastures, bored by steel as they sat in their automobiles, poisoned to die slowly, and dynamited as they slept in their homes. The reporter went on, where will end, no one knows. The world's richest people per capita were becoming the most murdered. Now, despite the danger to their lives, Molly uh, really very valiantly, as well as other Osage, crusaded for justice, even though it put a bullseye on their backs. Um, but authorities frequently ignored these crimes uh, because the victims were Native Americans, because of prejudice, and also because there was a great deal of corruption at that time. Uh, one of the things that surprised me was just how fragile our legal institutions were back still in the 1920s. It was very easy for the powerful to tilt the scales of justice by corruption and by paying off. Uh, law enforcement was also very poorly trained. Um, some of the records I found uh, and drew out of the National Archives were records on private eyes. And um, private eyes often filled the void of um, national law enforcement back then um, and local law enforcement. Um, but the problem with the private eyes is um, they often had criminal backgrounds themselves. They were often uh, affordable to the highest bidder. And the boundaries between a good man, and they were all men back then who were working these cases, uh, the boundaries between a good man uh, and a bad man were extremely porous. And many of the private eyes who Molly had hired to work on the case seemed to be covering up evidence uh, rather than revealing it. In 1923, the Osage Tribal Council finally issued a resolution demanding that federal authorities, uncontaminated by corruption, step in to investigate these crimes and capture the killers. Um, and it was then that the case was taken up by a rather obscure branch of the Justice Department at the time an organization that was then known as the Bureau of Investigation, and which would be later renamed, and we know it today, as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. And the Osage murder investigations would become one of the FBI's first major homicide cases. And one day uh, in the summer of 1925, this man, Tom White, a field agent at the time in the Bureau in Houston, received a urgent summons from headquarters in Washington, D.C., from the new bossman, J. Edgar Hoover, saying he wanted to see him right away. Now, like Molly, uh, Tom was someone who in many ways kind of reflected the transformation. He embodied the transformation of the country at that time. He was born in a log cabin on the Texas frontier. He was a member of essentially a tribal community of lawmen. His father had been a local sheriff. Tom grew up. He saw criminals hung when he was a boy. All his brothers became lawmen. There were three others. Um, Texas Rangers, some of them became, including Tom. Um, he grew up when, when justice was often meted out by the barrel of a smoking gun. And then by the time of the Osage murders, when he's being summoned to Washington, D.C., he has to wear a suit. Um, he's learning to adapt modern techniques like fingerprinting. Um, he has to file paperwork, which he can't stand. Now, when he joined the Bureau in 1917, the Bureau was a pretty ragtag operation, had only a smattering of field offices across the country. Agents were not authorized to carry guns. 
Um, they also did not have the power to make arrests. Uh, if an FBI agent or a bureau agent back then wanted to make arrests, they had to actually go to the local sheriff or local police officer and say, can you arrest this person for me? Um, and they had very limited jurisdiction over crimes. But one of the areas where they did have jurisdiction um, was over American Indian reservations, these federal lands. And so that is why this case fell to the bureau. And that is why it became one of the FBI's first major homicide cases at the time. Now, when Tom White shows up at headquarters, he doesn't know why he's been summoned. Uh, many of the old frontier lawmen were being purged from the ranks of the Bureau. The Bureau had just come out of its own uh, oil corruption scandal involving Teapot Dome. Um, he can see many of the kind of new breed of agents that Hoover was hiring, these college boys who were said to type faster than they shot. The old timers like White would refer to them as, um, as Boy Scouts. Now, Many of the new agents um, had better were better educated, but they had no um, experience, actually, or very little experience with criminal investigations. And so Hoover had kept on the ranks just a few of these old frontier lawmen, including Tom White, um, who were known as the Cowboys. So when White shows up uh, at headquarters, he meets none other than J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, this picture was taken of Hoover just a few months before. Doesn't look like the Hoover as we would come to recognize him with the jowls. He's 29 years old at the time, uh, new to the Bureau. Um, now, one thing you need to understand about Hoover was he hated tall agents. He was very insecure about his stature. Uh, he used to keep a dais behind his desk. And taller agents were very afraid to be summoned to headquarters because if Hoover saw you were tall, he might fire you. <laughs> so Tom White shows up and he stands 6'4". And he's defiantly wearing a cowboy hat. And he's looming over the new boss man. And Hoover begins to tell him about the Osage murder cases. The Bureau had actually been working on the case for two years, and the results had been completely disastrous. They had failed to make a single arrest. They had also gone an outlaw out of jail, hoping to use him as an informant, a guy named Blackie. Um, well, Blackie quickly slipped away, robbed a bank, and killed the police officer. Now, Blackie would later meet his own unfortunate uh, fate when he was gunned down after escaping from jail. So um, Hoover, believe it or not, our most kind of autocratic bureaucrat in history, who will go on to serve nearly five decades in power, was insecure about his position. And he feared that a scandal might end his dreams of building a bureaucratic empire. And he needs Tom White to take over the case to essentially save his bacon. So White uh, puts together an undercover team, recognizing the dangers that existed. Um, and most interestingly, he recruits probably the only American Indian agent who was then in the Bureau. And they go in. They assume identities. They go in as cattlemen. One went in as an insurance salesman and sold actual policies, according to the records, though I do not know what happened to those uh, policies. Um, and in many ways, um, the case is less, this is one of the undercover agents uh, who went in, one of the cowboys. Uh, this picture was given to me by a descendant. And in many ways, the investigation was less like a criminal investigation than an espionage case. There were moles, there were double agents, there was possibly a triple agent. They did not know who they could trust in authority. Their reports would quickly leak. Um, they were being trailed and followed. They carried guns, although they were not authorized to because of the danger. Now. The case has many ins and outs, and I think it's more powerful to kind of read it in the context of the book. But ultimately, what they did is they followed the money to see um, who was profiting from the murders, particularly from the murders of Molly's family members. And that led them uh, to one of the most prominent white settlers. And what's more, to a man who Molly knew well, who many of the Osage knew well. And one of the things that made these crimes so sinister was that they were deeply intimate crimes. To steal the Osage money, uh, they involved often pretending to love the Osage um, while systematically, over years, plotting to kill them. And when I um, struggled, even after I worked on the book about five years, to put into words that level of deception and what it must have been like for Molly Burkhart to realize it, 
but perhaps um, Shakespeare's phrase comes closest to it. He said, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none conspiracy, hide it in smiles and affability. Now, after I had visited the Osage Nation Museum and, and saw this uh, panoramic photograph, the museum director went down into the basement and she retrieved an image of the missing panel. And there, peering out from the corner very creepily, was the man um, that the FBI, the Bureau, had identified, that prominent settler. He was the so-called devil. And I think it's important to understand that the Osage had removed that picture not to forget, as so many of us, so many Americans had, but because they can't forget what had happened. Now, I want to just say a quick word about the structure of the book, uh, because it's structured in a way um, I had never organized material. Um, it's told largely from the point of view of three different individuals. The first individual is Molly Burkhart. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken um, uh, not shortly before her death. Um, and one of the documents I found um, in the National Archives about her, I think is particularly revealing. It was a document um, from, and if my memory serves me correctly, 1934, and I think she died in 1936, so two years before her death. Um, and it was her appeal of her quote unquote incompetency. And the court had finally deemed her quote unquote competent. And so here was this woman in 1934 in the United States of America finally granted access to control her own fortune, her own destiny, and the rights of a full-fledged American citizen. The second chronicle is told largely from the point of view of Tom White. Here you could see his transformation, wearing his fedora and a suit with Hoover whose jowls are beginning to grow. <laughs> um, and while this book has a great deal of evil, uh, it also has a great deal of goodness in both Molly, who valiantly crusaded for justice, and in Tom White, who quietly uh, and justly uh, pursued the evidence. The final uh, point of view, uh, Chronicle, is told from the present, from my perspective as the historian or reporter, whatever you want to call it. And um, I do that so I can show what had happened to the Osage today. This is a bar. Many of the old oil boom towns are now ghost towns. This is a shuttered bar in the town where Anna Brown was last seen before she disappeared uh, that I saw and had a friend take this photograph. Um, one of the most powerful uh, things in, in my research was I tracked down descendants uh, in the present of both the murderers and the victims. Uh, I tracked down this woman, Margie Burkhart, who was the granddaughter of Molly Burkhart. Uh, who told me what it was like to grow up without cousins and aunts. She took me out to the graveyard uh, where, near where Molly grew up, where so many of the murdered, her murdered relatives are buried. She gave me a sense of how this history is still living today and how it still reverberates. Now, one of the reasons I told the story this way was to show the elusiveness of trying to gather history especially when there is a criminal conspiracy. Um, often it is only over time that more evidence emerges, that we begin to get a fuller portrait of what happens. And one of the things I try to show in my section, based on a wealth of new information, information that was indeed, most of which was collected at the National Archives at a branch out in Fort Worth, Texas, that there was a much deeper and darker conspiracy that the Bureau never exposed. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I guess there's a, I think there's a mic somewhere. Right here. Where? Oh, oh, got it, great. Thank you so much, Thank what, you. A, what a gift. Um, I've read your book. Have you learned anything significant since you wrote the book, number one? And number two, when I heard your presentation on The Last City, my question then was, what book are you working on now? I'll repeat the question. 
uh, that was a long time ago since you heard that other presentation. Um, I'll go uh, in order. So the um, I've done a lot of events. I was just out in Oklahoma. One of the more powerful things was to have um, descendants of both the murderers and the victims come to events. Um, I was at an event in Tulsa where Margie came, uh, Molly, um, as well as descendants of the devil. Um, one of those descendants who I'd actually not met before um, um, had come up to me beforehand and then in, in, at the question period expressed remorse uh, and actually went up and, and gave Margie a hug at the end. But again, it was just such a reminder of how the history still reverberates today. Um, many of the descendants of the murders and the victims still live in the same neighborhoods. Their fates are intertwined, and in many ways, that's the story of America. I have received um, several emails um, from some Osage um, um, mentioning new potential evidence in cases. I have not had a chance yet to look into them, um, but one of the things I try to show is that the number of deaths was far larger than previously reported, um, and that there were really scores, perhaps hundreds, and so some of the evidence trickling in is further confirmation of that. Um, in terms of my next project, I need, I'm working on a New Yorker story right now, but I need a new book idea, so if anybody has one, I promise a really nice steak or fish or whatever you like to eat dinner. <laughs> Veggie, whatever you do. <laughs> Over here. Over there, yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that, the, um, that it was really difficult to kind of find um, evidence because with criminal conspiracies, they often come out with time. Um, what was the most challenging part of the research process for you? Uh, so it's a good question. I, I, you know, I don't think researchers um, or writers get points for difficulty in the sense that the product is the product, the book is the book, and it, it can be easy to have produced or difficult. But this was by far the most challenging project I'd ever worked on. It took me far longer, um, close to five years from beginning to end. And that was because I was dealing with people who often live more on the margins of society. And I really wanted, as best I could, to give a sense of what their life was like. Um, Molly Burkhardt in the accounts was always usually just one sentence. She had no agency, no backstory, no emotion. What was it like for her? And so part of my struggle was to try, as best I could, to glean that information. And that came through going through archives. Um, out in Fort Worth, I found the grand jury, secret grand jury testimony that was incredibly helpful. Um, I was able to find letters between her and uh, Ernest, her husband, um, tracking down the descendants. Um, I did not want it to be just the cataloging of the dead. Um, I wanted it to be, uh, to try my best to record the voices of the victims and to identify, in some cases, even new killers who had not previously been identified. I should add that for all my efforts, one of the things I also try to show is that I failed in many ways because of the breadth of the number of conspirators. conspirators. This was less a story about who did it than who didn't do it. And um, in many cases, the perpetrators denied their victims, not only their lives, uh, but in a secondary but very nefarious crime, they also denied them their history. They denied them a proper accounting of what had transpired uh, in covering up the crimes. Thank you. I want to go back to one of the things you said at the beginning, which is uh, the history of this country. Um, prior to that, uh, situation it was happening in some situations where a bureau of investigation wasn't investigating because it, it didn't exist and to indians today that are abused in similar fashion is not necessarily a murder situation i'm curious what led to a bureau of investigation investigating how did that get to them to say hey let's find out okay so indians were murdered indians had been murdered and so i'm curious how that started yeah it's a good question um <clears throat> So it was twofold. Um, part of it was um, the Bureau had very limited jurisdiction, and because they had jurisdiction over American Indian reservations, this case fell to them. The Bureau initially took it on, um, but as I described, bungled it. And in the records, um, Hoover actually tried to dump the case. Um, uh, he wanted to dump it back on the state authorities because he 
was afraid they couldn't solve it. He didn't want the embarrassment from that. So his commitment to the, to the justice, which gets to your question, uh, was, was rather self-serving. Um, after Blackie uh, killed the police officer, he was then afraid of a scandal. And so um, he needed to solve the case or felt pressure to solve the case. Um, I think in the case of Tom White, um, uh, evidence suggests he was a really pretty decent individual and so he was motivated to try to get the evidence. Um, Hoover closed the case, which I try to show in the book prematurely in many ways. He used the case in many ways to cement his reputation um, and built up his own mythology, um, but he closed the case in many ways prematurely. And because of that, many other murders uh, of the Osage that were part of the Reign of Terror did in fact go unsolved. Um, did you come across anything um, of interest having to do with uh, religion, either traditional Indian religion or modern religion as practiced by either the killed or the killers? Yeah, so um, one of the uh, um, uh, the so-called devil, uh, one of the masterminds, was a, professed to be a deeply devout individual. Um, in many ways, uh, was presented himself as a benefactor, actually often sometimes referred to himself as the reverend. Um, and so that gets to the two-faced quality. Uh, Molly was a very devout person um, and straddled in many ways, um, kind of she was unmoored uh, as she tried to kind of marry these traditions of tradition. Her mom was one of the last of the Osage elders um, who practiced all the Osage traditions. Um, and she was raised Catholic because she went to that uh, boarding school as a young girl. And so she was um, Catholic, but she still practiced some Osage traditions. She was not an Osage who cut her hair like a flapper. She still dressed in traditional clothing. Um, one of the elements of these cases was it, this was a period of, 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 the, of the Osage being unmoored in many ways uh, from their uh, traditions. Um, and there was a lot of intermarrying. Um, Hopefully that answers your question a little. Yeah. Thanks a lot for um, your presentation. A couple uh, questions. I wonder if there's been any effort at uh, reparations or reconciliation. And then a second question, um, as a writer and historian, do you experience outrage and sadness? And if so, how do you accommodate those in the process of preparing the book? Um, so. I have not heard um, so far of any effort at reparations. Um, the Osage did um, have a suit that went on for many years against the US government for the mismanagement of their trust funds. They did eventually receive a settlement of $300 million, uh, but that was probably just a fraction of what they ultimately lost. Um, in terms of the sadness, I think, um, it's, it's, it's hard not to feel that when you, when you research something like this. I began doing the research for book collecting photographs, which I integrated into the book because I really wanted this to be a work of documentation and photographs became as essential as the text for me. And I collected photographs of the victims and early on and I just had a few photographs and those numbers of victim photographs um, grew over time. Um, and they were a reminder of, of, of what the book is about in many ways. Um, and I don't think you, you lose that. You actually hopefully harness it. Um, you know, you don't want to be maudlin or write falsely, um, but um, you do want to have some moral impetus in what you're doing. Um, and I certainly felt that in this project. I don't feel that in all the things I write about, but I certainly felt that. Um, and when I meet, met with the descendants, I particularly felt that. I. Um, called up one descendant who had an unsolved case in her family. And uh, I had gathered evidence, again, through the archives out in Fort Worth, <clears throat> identifying the likely perpetrator based on a wealth of circumstantial evidence. And she began to cry on the phone. And I felt quite badly. And I said, I'm so sorry. I suddenly wondered if I should not have told her this. And she said, no, no, no. We've been living with this for so long. And um, again, it gets to this point that this wasn't that long ago, and this history still resonates today. 
How many more questions? One more. One more, okay. Uh, recently, um, President Trump was interviewed by a newscaster and uh, the newscaster asked him, you know, why was he in bed with Putin, that Putin was a murderer and a bad man. And this is one time I agreed with Trump. Trump said that uh, America uh, is not so innocent. And I just wonder why it's so hard for America to acknowledge her messes, you know. They want to hide it, and then when people bring it out in the open, they, they deny it or they just don't want to talk about it. Well, I do think in the case of many of the, a story like this, um, um, it is important that we reckon with this history, the history of Native Americans, this clash of uh, Native Americans, white settlers, um, for lack of a better word, is in many ways the original sin from which the country was born. I don't think we can understand the country unless we understand a case like this, um, those forces that played out. We can't understand the emergence of modern law enforcement. We can't understand, in many ways, the emergence of a modern country. Um, Molly and Tom White kind of thrust together, in many ways, reflect this change in the country that is reflected in this case. Um, and there was an Osage who I interviewed uh, not long ago, uh, after the book, who walked from almost all the way from Oklahoma to North Dakota uh, during the Standing Rock demonstrations. And during that, he was a veteran of the US Army, won a Purple Heart in Afghanistan, received a Purple Heart uh, for service in Afghanistan, where he was wounded in the knee. And yet he made this pilgrimage. And during that time, he told me that he thought a lot about the Osage murders. And the cases, the incidents are separated by nearly a century. And they're, some of the specifics are very different. I mean, the Sui weren't making money from oil. They were trying to protect their natural environment. Um, but he said it was still the same fundamental issue, which is the rights of Native Americans to protect their sovereign lands, to protect their resources. And so I don't think we can understand things like Standing Rock um, unless we also understand uh, what took place uh, back in the 1920s with the Osage. Thank you again so much for coming.